welcome to the backstory on finances and, and finances in the context of a pandemic in the city of Longmont. My name is Tim Waters, and I have the good fortune of hosting uh, conversations with community leaders, uh, city officials, elected officials, policymakers, activists on topics of interest and relevance to the community. I do this as a volunteer for Longmont Public Media. And today's topic, uh, City of Longmont Finances, in most years probably wouldn't be the kind of uh, story that people might be interested in. But, but this year, I think it's a different story. Uh, and here to tell that story are, are faces that viewers of the backstory are familiar with, Carol Dominguez, city manager, and Jim Golden, a uh, longtime uh, chief financial officer for the city of Longmont. So uh, welcome, gentlemen, and thank you for doing this. I know how busy your, your schedules are and uh, squeezing this in with all of the other things that you're asked to do. I appreciate it. And I'm certain uh, folks who watch this will appreciate it as well. Um, so Jim, let's start with, uh, we're in the first, we're in the middle of January as we record this. Uh, you two fellas, <laughs> along with a lot of other, others, put in a ton of work to build the budget for the city. Um, and there's, with accounting for all kinds of different uh, sources of revenue and lots of estimates and uncertainties with which you have to deal. Just talk about the highlights of, of that, Jim. How you, what does it take to get us to into the you know, first month of the year uh, having built this budget out, what are the big assumptions? What are the kind of uh, sources of revenues you're anticipating and, and estimating that roll up into a city budget? Well, you know, the city budget is pretty big. It's about $350 million. And uh, so that's a, a, a lot of staff that is involved in putting that together from their perspective of what the needs of the city may be, whether it be operating needs or capital needs for the current year or into the future. So we start our budget process in, in April or so, actually our CIP process in March of each year in anticipation on a schedule to bring this all to the city council in the beginning of September uh, and have it adopted uh, according to the city charter in, in time so that typically it's adopted by, by sometime in November at the latest. So uh, it's a big deal and funding all those sources we need to do uh, from our end of things, uh, besides pulling together all the data we're getting from departments on, on what their their needs and requests are, uh, we do deal um, with revenues uh, quite a bit to see how we can fund these things. Because uh, we do have to make choices because there's hardly ever enough revenue to do everything that that is uh, uh, going to be requested. So uh, what's critical is, is for the number one critical item is sales tax. Sales and use tax is our largest revenue item uh, outside of utility fees. But within our general fund and four other major operating funds, sales and use tax is a, is a major uh, revenue driver. So we use that for both operating and capital needs. Uh, and so it's pretty critical. Uh, we track that, as you know, Tim, we put out uh, reports monthly on the status of our sales and use tax collections. Uh, we, uh, me and my staff, we watch that carefully. We look for trends, we see what's going on. And what we are typically trying to do is come to the budget process probably in sometime in July. Sometimes it drags or lags a little later because we try to make the, la the last possible decision we can with an estimate of, of what we're gonna put into that budget for the next year. And so uh, we, we, like I said, we put a lot of time into that. And then whatever that number is pretty critical in driving uh, the overall expenses in the general fund, the streets fund, the public improvement fund. So what, what we end up doing then uh, in addition to that is another big factor is the um, market pay and, and the cost of pay and benefits. Because that's of course, besides Besides capital projects, that is a very large um, factor in the city's operating budget is the cost of salaries and benefits. And that's something that we also have HR working on uh, throughout the second quarter, ba basically gathering market data from other entities. That's gonna come around to a number that's gonna drive the expense side 
of our budgets as well. Let us know how much we have. If we're going to make market pay, um, then what will be left over for, for other needs in the, in the general fund as well as other major operating funds. So those are two big ones. Property tax is another big revenue source. Uh, you know, sales and use tax is like 90 million, I mean, uh, $80 million. But, but uh, property tax is $24 million or so. But we have less of a role in projecting that. That's really just coming from the assessor's office every year. So we get that number and, and work it into our, our uh, projections as we go through the, the, the process during each summer. So uh, those, are, those are really the biggest things. Development revenues is another factor. Other smaller revenues, you know, we do go through all of our revenues and make projections, but the sales tax is really gonna drive what our budget's gonna look like from year to year. So um, we, you get into 2020, uh, you've done all that work. Um, uh, you track it uh, diligently to make certain that your estimates are within plus or minus of what they need to be. So, uh, so you've got continuity as you go through the year. And before you're through the first quarter of last year, um, you've got a pandemic. Uh, and, and I'm guessing while you've dealt with disruptions, right? You have had economic slowdowns, you've had uh, the effects of a flood, we've had the Great Recession. We've had all those things, but you've never had to deal with the uncertainties of a pandemic. Uh, no one alive has had to do that. So you get into the first quarter of last year, what are some of those recalculations or recalibrations you're having to do before you get through the first quarter of last year uh, in, in the impact of what you thought might be the impact of the, the uh, pandemic on your revenues? Well, you know, actually, um... That, that was, you know, come, on, come down on us pretty quickly. And we had to try to, to get a sense of what could be the worst case scenario. And, and really we, we had no clue as to what might continue to come in versus what might stop. Uh, so, and, you know, being conservative and trying to make projections for revenue, uh, I took a look at that and knowing what was open at the time, and what we were continuing to see operating within the city is what I really took a look at and said, we're gonna count on this coming in, but not at its normal levels. Uh, and I may have reduced them down to 75% or something like that. I can't recall exactly what I used. And then the rest of it that I couldn't be sure of, I said, we're not gonna get. So, you know, our worst case scenario was our first projection. And, and that was as, as high as a, a, a third, it was a um, $13 million shortfall in sales and use tax. And, and uh, that was though thinking that at that point in time, no, knowing what we did or as knowing what we didn't know about the pandemic at that point in time, as little as we knew, we were thinking, well, this could go on for a couple of months. And so what we're experiencing today at that point in time, it's gonna go on for a couple of months. And then after that, we're hearing there's probably gonna be a recession and we need to put that into our projections as well. And that's kind of how we got to the, the, the first estimates. And you said that we track, I track sales tax diligently. Before 2020, I thought I said I tracked it diligently. <laughs> But beginning in last spring and you know, to this day, I track it daily. So I, I never paid attention to how much comes in every day, but, but all through that budget process and us trying to decide how much are we gonna project that sales tax revenue at, we were watching it come in day by day. And, and, and I still do watch, there's still things I keep continue to do even though things have, have, have turned around from what we were looking at nine months ago, so. So, um, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, go ahead. Uh, so, you're in the first quarter of the year. Your you're chief financial officer, Harold, who is paid to be conservative. You know, I mean, that's every chief financial officer in the world. That's, they live, they sleep, eat, cons being conservative. Um, so you're now from your CFO here and you're, you're, you're anticipating now pretty substantial shortfalls. 
right? Jim just is using maybe a 25% loss or shortfall and, uh, and what that translates into in terms of dollars. You now have, however, a chance to make decisions with almost no data, right? I mean, you've got that first quarter, but but now you're you're really operating with a whole bunch of uncertainties. What, what are the kinds of decisions now, as a city manager with your team, you start to make in anticipation of getting the, the city through this? Um, where I mean, you don't have options. You got some reserves, but you don't have options to debt finance your operations like the like Congress does, you gotta make it all work in the year. So what are some of the uncertainties, some of the decisions you were making without a whole lot of data to make them? Yeah, it's interesting. So um, I joke with Jim, you know, early in my career, I did a lot of budget and finance work. So I like to dabble in his world occasionally, drive him nuts. Um, but um, yeah, I do wanna compliment Jim on this as we start off. Um, and, and, and you may remember this, um, I hope Jim does. Early on in this is, so a bit of a backstory to the backstory. As a team, we started talking about this, I wanna say in January when we started seeing it and we were meeting occasionally and, and it ramped up. And, and when we really started getting into it, you know, it was that this conversation of what do we think this is going to be? What do we think the loss is going to be? Um, Jim actually was, I believe, the first finance director in, in Boulder County to come forward um, with a projection. And, and eventually, I think multiple finance directors in the county were calling him to go, how do you do this? How, do you, how did you move through this? Um, and we knew it was, you know, and this is what I appreciate about Jim, and we knew this was going to be a significant issue for us. And when you get that number, you kind of just... Um, it's, um, it's a pause like I, I think I've never experienced because what you also have to then figure out is, so what do we do? Because it's in times like these that you really need the operations of the organization to be there to support the community because you don't know what issues are gonna come at you. Um, you then also have to think about the lives of the people who work in the organization and how this is gonna impact them um, and, and so it created a lot of really difficult conversations. And um, the thing that I think, um, looking back on it, um, a lot of cities did a lot of different things. But, you know, we started off to say, if we could just capture everything that we have in terms of capital projects, you know, dollars that we can really control to say, we're just not going to do it this year. What does that look like? Um, and then Jim was giving me some analysis in terms of the various fund balances that we have. And, you know, just sort of pulling this thing together to say, here's how we can try to start managing the gap. Um, and then almost immediately we put in a hiring freeze and um, really just held um, on a lot of those discretionary expenditures. Um, and, and what that let us do then is really then also start looking at the operational pieces of this. Um, you know, a lot of people know, and we didn't um, call a furlough as early as some folks did. Um, I think that was, uh, and Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, th those were very conscious conversations that we were having to go, do we need to do this? If so, when do we have this conversation? And then let's watch the data as it's coming in. So it was a really data informed decision as we were moving through. Um, and, and, and that was also about, we knew we needed the people to be there when we came out of this. Um, so we were just moving through all of these different things, trying to then dictate operations in terms of what we needed to do and repurposing folks. And, um, you know, it's a long story, but it was probably one of, it, it was the most challenging because we, he modeled off of the 08 recession none of us knew how people were gonna to respond to this. Um, we've never closed every business in our community for, what was it, Jim, two months? Close. A month and a half or more? You know, and our conversation was, this number's predicated on a two month closure. If it goes beyond that, it's gonna be different. And, and so those were things, as these rules started becoming more strict and adjusting, 
he's watching and he's telling us and, and he's coming through. And we were literally discussing it on a daily basis, trying to make daily decisions that we felt first and foremost was in the best interest of our community. Second, allowed us to continue to provide the services that we needed to to our community during this time. And third, really respect the position where the staff, or the members of our staff, the positions they were in and the impacts as we were moving through this. So it was, um, I probably moved around in a circle, but it was, it was a tough process. Well, I think, I think that's an important part of the story, frankly. I, I, I mean, everybody would be easy uh, under the conditions with which, under which everybody's been operating. You could just assume, right? Yeah, there are a bunch of dis, you know, hard decisions that have to be made. Uh, but, but the calculations, uh, the consideration of where your priorities are and, and what kind of capacity do you need to maintain? So when you get to the other side of this, um, number one, you can deliver services through it and you've got capacity on the other side to ramp back up, right? To, to meet the expectations. I mean, those are, those are tough and, and serious decisions. And, you know, they, when they affect people's livelihoods, um, it's a big deal. In fact, um, uh, I think it's important to, for some people to understand there were cities around Longmont that early in, in the pandemic, they started laying people off, they, they, and it, not just hiring freezes. Um, we didn't have to do that. And I know there were questions um, that some people asked about, well, why are, why are we laying people off if, you know, if Broomfield is laying people off or Boulder's laying people off? You know, that, that, those, those questions, we were at, we were, Harold and I were having those conversations quite frequently. Every time mm -hmm. that one of those things were, were announced at another uh, entity, we kept looking at each other. You know, there's a, a few things that, that, that we're factoring in here that, that maybe we're not factoring elsewhere. And we, and we had, and, and we're not, and, and keep in mind, there, there were, you mentioned some of those communities. There are a lot of other communities that didn't have to do cuts. We're not unique. I don't want to say that we're unique because Reality is, we relied on some reserves, and uh, we, a lot of entities do have those type of reserves. It was how much impact was their communities going through, though, <clears throat> and whether they could deal with those or not. We had not hired our seasonal workers, and so we did not have to let them go. And those are furloughs elsewhere, and mm -hmm. so that, that's a bit of a difference there. Uh, we just never did put those people on the payroll because of the timing there. Others had already gone that far. Um, we had the benefit. Well, first of all, we have we do have some pretty decent reserves. We still try to continue to to reach higher reserve levels that we have as targets. But we did have a stability reserve of of one point seven million dollars, and and that was in in our general fund. I mean, and and that was something that we intended for. I don't want to say a pandemic, but a reduction in revenues. Yeah. So whether it be an economic downturn of some point of some kind that would reduce our revenues. So this really fell right into that, that reasoning. We thought, well, we've got $1.7 million here in the general fund. Now we were looking at a general fund shortfall of as high of 10 as 10.6 million. So that's just to help, right? We also though, had the luck that we have had been building up this reserve for OPEB, it's other post-employment benefits. And it's, it's a, a, a commitment that, that actually we were being told we needed to put away for. Um, it involves our retirees and the fact that they get to purchase those who, who uh, retire before age 65 can purchase the city's insurance and they're buying it at the city's cost. So in a sense, that's a discount. So that's a cost that, that we're in, covering for them in a sense. Well, we were told 10, 12 years ago that by the accounting ch changes in, in, a, in accounting requirements that we need to start putting money away for that. And we didn't, it didn't quite make sense to me even back then but it turned out that, you know, we were paying as we were going and we were just paying that expense year after year. So I kept questioning, so when am I ever gonna take money out of this reserve? 
new auditors, uh, new actuaries all come into place a, a little over a year ago. And what they point out to us is, you know what? You don't need this. And you can take that reserve and take it off your books. So we said, let's put it back where it came from. And so the, the general fund ended up getting over $2 million of a basically a rebate of money it had been putting over into that fund over the last 10 years. Between that and the stability reserve, we had almost $4 million as a starting point. Uh, and when we also had put two and a half million dollars of one-time expense in a 2020 budget towards the first and main transit station. We had fund balance available at the end of 19. We used that in our budgeting process to help fund that project. We put on hold. And so we said, well, you know what? That's unfunded now. And so that got us up to six and a half million dollars of potential fallback. So that only put us in a position where we needed to start to identify three and a half million dollars of, of, of reductions in our 2020 operating budget for the general fund. And, and so we, we did keep looking at each other going, is it time, do we need to do this? But we we're like, well, we've got this fallback. And then month after month, we began to realize that our, our projections, at least from a sales tax perspective, were too high. Uh, we kept reducing them as the shortfall that we were, we were experiencing was nowhere near what we had projected. Uh, we did have other areas that we, we were going to incur shortfalls uh, for. And so that was over and above those sales tax projections and the general fund had, and like I said, at one point it was as high as a $10.6 million shortfall projection. But that was like at the end of May that we said that. And probably from that point forward, we began to notice that this is not, this sales tax is not coming in as short anywhere near as, as what the conservative CFO thought it was going to come in at. And that was to our benefit. Um, well, I think too, if I can add to this, yeah. you almost have to go back to the budget year before this. Um, when Jim talked about the, the allocation of funds um, to some of the capital projects, um, what you may remember as part of that conversation is we had extra ongoing revenue that we said we want to put to one-time funds and hold because A, we knew it wasn't going to be a reappraisal year. Right, yeah. And B, we were afraid- For property tax purposes. For property tax. B, we were afraid there was going to be a recession based on some of the economic indicators that we were seeing. So I remember those conversations. Dollars that Jim just referred to, it was actually in that decision to say, we're not going to put it in ongoing funding. We're going to put it in one-time funding, but then made it really easy to say, we're going to unfund those projects. Uh, and then that folds then into, while well, he's doing this, we then immediately are jumping into building the budget for next year. Again, with a lot of information that we just don't really have a full grasp on based on a pandemic that is new to all of us. Uh, Jim, you, re you made reference to uh, being lucky when you were talking about the, um, is it the OPED uh, fund? OPED. Um, and I would say that, uh, I don't know whose definition it is, but someone's definition was shared with me along the way of good luck is the intersection of preparation and opportunity, right? Um, so you make your own good luck. You were you had you had prepared for it, and you executed when you had to. So uh, yeah, good on you for the good luck uh, that that uh, that arrived at the right time. So you, you get into the year. At, at Harold was just both of you referred to the to the uh, monitoring sales tax revenues uh, that continued to materialize. Talk a little bit about what you know, Jim. You made reference earlier to not every city was affected the same way. Right? Not every city had to make cuts because um, it has the, the the pandemic has had a very differential effect in cities. Some of them are far more affected than others. So, so what are your explanations for that? Why is that some uh, have, have been affected more deeply financially than others? Well, you know, as far our sales tax, um, we it, it started to decline as soon as the um, pandemic hit. I mean, that even. February sales tax 
which was due in uh, March 20th, even that was down. And the reason being because because some businesses weren't were not making that payment on the 20th of, of March. So we saw that drop and we, um, we then turned around and, and started going, now that the stores are closing and now that everything's shutting down, it's gonna get much worse. So we, we you know, made those large projections. March sales tax was actually up 6%. And, and that was a, a shocker to us, but as you recall, you know, as soon as, as the pandemic hit, everyone made the run to the, to the stores to, to buy the provisions and things. And that really gave us that boost in March. Um, but in April, sales tax was down 12.7%. And that's where everyone's sales tax, everyone was seeing the same thing happen. They had a little bit of boost and then the bottom fell out. So we just, we just didn't know how far, you know, how low, how, how far is the floor here? What was the bottom? Yeah. How much worse will it get? And yeah, we, so we, of course, made some, some uh, conservative projections. You know, come to find out now over time, a lot of other entities in Boulder County did much better than, than what they had projected. Uh, you mentioned Boulder, I think Denver as well are two entities, of course, that we've heard a lot that, about how they've had to do significant cuts and that they've, they've had uh, you know, large reductions in their sales tax revenues. And you, know, you, you get back, you, know, you don't hear the, the term bedroom community as much anymore, right? Yeah. Well, but you know, I think this is a big factor in these cities that didn't have as much of a revenue impact because a lot of people commute to work in Boulder, a lot of people commute to work in Denver. And when they're there, they spend money. Uh, they spend money during the day or when their work day is over before they go back to wherever they live, they're spending money in, that, in those two cities. And a lot of that went away. Uh, the, for Boulder, the university went away. And so those, those factors made a big difference in their sales tax declines. Boulder doesn't have as, many, as much big box, obviously, as Longmont does. And that's another factor for why they, they suffered, uh, had larger losses than other entities did. Uh, and we've got the big boxes and we've got people who uh, were staying here and working from home here and not leaving town and going and spending their money elsewhere, whether it be because they're, that's where they used to work or now they're working in Longmont or whether they were just leaving town to go shopping you know, at Costco, which we know that people in Longmont do, but yeah. probably stopped doing during the pandemic. And we also know that they leave town to go eat sometimes, but they certainly didn't do that either during the pandemic. And so we were benefiting by the fact that everyone was basically tied to Longmont, yeah. and continuing to, to have to eat, have to get by the things they need to live. Um, some things stopped and went away. Automobile sales went away for like two months. It just pretty much nothing coming from that source. Uh, but, but those big box stores kept, kept us going and, and our restaurants, they, they didn't, you know, they certainly didn't do the type of business that they were doing pre-pandemic, but people did still stay and still purchase and keep those, some of the, most of those restaurants in play. Yeah. I think to that point, you know, the, the interesting story here is, um, and we, I remember us talking about this, probably the first time we've ever really seen you know, you hear us talk about leakage of sales tax dollars. Um, Jim and I talked about this. We've seen it where we've had almost no leakage because people were kept within the community. And so they, the, the dollars were still circulating there. Um, you know, to his point about uh, the big box, you know, when I talked to my colleagues, that was something that we all discussed. And I think it's important to really talk about that's the benef benefit of having a diverse local economy. 
um, I think those communities that had a more diverse local economy are the communities that you're tending to see that didn't have the same impacts of those that are solely dependent on tourism or dependent on universities that don't necessarily have that diversity in their, in their retail. Um, I think that was um, a big component on this. But the other thing that I think was incredibly important was really um, the people that lived in our community um, and their support of local businesses. And whether it's going to the stores that remain open, um, any number of stories of people going to um, hardware stores, um, nurseries, but staying local to do that. Um, what was important, but then also supporting the local restaurants and retail that were doing stuff with pickup and drive through. Uh, they really supported those businesses, but also supported us by keeping that revenue in there. And, and so there's a big thank you on that one. Um, uh, that's a, that is an important part of the story. People need to know that, was, that wasn't just rhetoric. That translated into um, uh, some surviving and at the end of the day, the city being able to continue to deliver services, that's a big part of the story. Yeah. You're now, we're now middle of January uh, uh, when we're recording this. Um, so Jim, talk about uh, where are we now in terms of the kind of estimating you're doing going forward? Um, uh, what types of revenues still have not kind of uh, materialized or, or rebounded the way um, they will eventually? And how do we account for that? And then what are the implications that residents ought to understand? Well, um, well, first of all, with the sales tax, since that's the number one revenue, uh, it, ironically, uh, we, you know, all my projections were horrible, right? So <laughs> they were nowhere near reality. So as it turned out, uh, we, we are probably gonna end this year. And I only know right now through uh, November because uh, December results will come in during here during the month of January. But through um, the month of November, we're probably up around 3.8% over the previous year. Our budget was 2.9% uh, increase or so. So we are actually exceeding the budget that we had for sales tax for 2020. And I'm sure that we will uh, will stay above the budget level with only a month to go. Um, I, so that's, that's finished well. Sales tax, hopefully, especially since our projections for 21 were again, somewhat conservative because we made them all the way back in July when we were still projecting shortfalls. So uh, we, we would have to have a, uh, would decline and a, a large decline to actually not meet budget. So, uh, so we're in a good position from that perspective. But uh, other revenues, uh, you know, they, they still suffered. And they, anything that was tied to a service that is, is, was not fully available as it was pre-pandemic and then maybe had a user charge attached to it, that really did have an impact. And in the general fund, we still did have uh, at least $4 million of, of shortfall from, um, from revenues impacted, say, by the pandemic. We had a few other revenues that just didn't come in as budgeted for other purposes, non-pandemic related, but at least a $4 million shortfall from revenues that, that didn't come in because we did not offer our services at, at the fullest level so and recreation is you know over 75 percent of that number uh you know we do also have uh, other revenues tied to the museum as uh was also a, really had a large shortfall in revenues compared to their budget at least and then uh fees for for disconnects we stopped shutting off uh our our utility service for our customers and so there's there's revenues connected to that, but there's also costs that went away there as well. So that one didn't hurt us as much. We were able to reduce costs in these services that were shut down or, or not offered. That was offsetting that revenue shortfall. 
but uh, we couldn't entirely do that for, for recreation and museum. And so we had large shortfalls there. Our court revenues are fine revenues from anything, whether it be parking, um, library fines, obviously these things weren't happening uh, during the pandemic. So we, we, were, uh, uh, we had a reduction in all those as well. So they all make up to $4 million. And those, uh, those haven't stopped yet. I mean, we, we have to expect to see that again in 21. We did build our budgets a bit more conservative with uh, an expectation that this would would roll over into 21 to some degree but but I don't think to the you know if we're sitting here saying that that we're not going to be fully vaccinated before ha at least halfway through the year or later that's not how we projected our revenues and so we still have challenges in front of us with 21 revenues uh, not potentially meeting budget either and, and from the same types of sources, from uh, recreation activities, the museum, those right. kinds of that are, right. that are not, that are not tax, they're really fee-based, right? I mean, the revenues that are generated through fees and fines. Right. Um, and so, uh, Harold, talk about some of the specific examples, because I know there'll be interest in the, the whatever the it is, right? What, whichever program is someone's particular interest um, uh, and wanting to see it back to normal or you know fully operational or on the right on the schedule they're accustomed to. What are some of the examples where people just need to understand those are not funded what those are those programs are not funded with tax dollars. And until there's until their activity resumes, there won't be revenue generation. Yeah, so I, I think to go back to, to kind of set the stage for this and, and talk about what Jim pointed out. Um, when we went into the budget and presented it to council, um, essentially what we projected, and this was done in conjunction with our, uh, with Jeff Friesener and our recreation group, I think we projected a 25% reduction in revenue in recreation services. And so they did a 25% reduction sort of across the, the recreation sector and then we did a 30% reduction in the hours for our temporary staff members. So if you go back when we talk about we didn't have to do furloughs and things, we were still paying those individuals, but we knew going into 21, we couldn't continue that based on that revenue structure coming in. And, and so well, what does that mean? Well, that means when you, we're, we're now covering operations with, um, our full-time staff members in different venues and in a combination of some of the temporary staff members at the reduced hours. But if you look at things like um, the hours that we can operate the rec centers, how many people we can have in there. Now there's two drivers in this and they're both playing with each other. So one driver is what are we allowed to do based on the health orders that are in place at the time and, and how robust can our operations really be? The, going into the end of the year, we actually were allowing more people in until we saw the spike in cases, and then they, they backed off of that. So in many cases, we went from approximately 50% to 25%. So we're now able to have less people in facilities, which then reduces that revenue stream. And the, the, the best example in this, and there's a lot of questions on it, was our hockey uh, rink. Um, we have to prepare a month ahead of time um, so that we can open it in October. Based on what we were seeing on the numbers, we felt comfortable on the financial analysis that at 50% occupancy, we would be okay. So we start doing that work. It changes and we go to 25%. Yeah. We really had a long conversation of do we even open it or do we not open it? We said, well, we don't wanna lose what we've invested people need an outdoor recreation opportunity. But as we look into 21, based on how we structure the budget, we don't have the coverage that we do in 20. So remember it was open in October, November, and December, and that fell within that budget, but we knew in 21, into January was probably all we could absorb. And so that's how we talked about that issue because those user fees really come into play. Um, and so if you keep going and you keep losing, and then we know that many of the recreation programs probably are 
going to be fully operational until much later in the year, which is going to exacerbate, create a more difficult situation because we projected potentially an earlier opening that starts feeding. So that's that other deficit. And we're going to have to continue evaluating this to the point what we said is when we set some of these, um, when we set the budget, as orders change and we have the ability to open up, we will then get together, assess the revenue stream, assess what we can do, but then we actually have to come back in the budget process, adjust the revenue projections potentially, and adjust the expenditure so we can open up. So it's not an immediate switch that we can flip as we have opportunities because we still have this broader budget pressure in place. And, I, and I'm focusing on rec, but there are other areas where yeah. this exists. Jim, did I miss anything or misstate anything? No, you didn't. But, but I, I think what I need to add in is that, um, you know, so I talked about how our sales tax ended the year. I think the, the, the fact that between that, as well as the fact that um, we, we were able to save a lot of expenditures in the general fund um, from uh, our operating expenses as well. We were able to withstand the reductions that we had in, in uh, uh, mostly the recreation revenues and the other revenues, the 4 million plus of shortfall that I was talking about. Probably we used up, I would imagine, and I, we we'll know all this for sure until we close out the end of the year in a couple of months or so. But we probably have used up that OPEB reserve, but we would not have touched the stability reserve. And in fact, during the budget process, we did add another $1.4 million to that stability reserve. So it's now over $3 million stability reserve. We've got that. We were able to also uh, refund uh, the uh, the um, first and main transit station, right? And any of these other capital projects that we had unfunded or put on hold, they've all either been funded again or rebudgeted for 2021. So we we've really been able to to take care of those things and didn't have the hurt that we thought that we were gonna have. So. I don't want to say that, yeah, we're going to come up, we have these revenue shortfalls that we're going to have from these services, but there are fallbacks now that we had last year. Um, we don't have that OPEB anymore, but we do have a larger stability reserve. We, we do have capital projects. Again, we're still in a position to be able to deal with things. Um, and that, that's, you know, that's something that we have in our hand, in our pocket that, that we know going forward. Um, things have to get a lot worse for us to be in, in dire straits. Yeah, well, part of the story is the stewardship that, that you're, you're describing now and, um, and how there were kind of responsibility that you two have assumed for making certain that uh, all those funds are managed, the, the reserves are, are, are uh, conservative enough that um, they're there in, in the hard times and to restore a number of the projects that you've referred to. It, for me, it's, it's kind of a, a good news, bad news, and cautionary tale, right? The good news is sales taxes have, have continued to materialize and, and many of the city's operations funded that way. Kind of the bad news is you're, you're still gonna have to struggle to bring back up to kind of pre-pandemic levels some of the fee-funded activities, recreation, museum, et cetera. And then the cautionary tale, and this is maybe how we'll close it out, there's still uncertainties you're managing as you anticipate, Jim or Harold, one of you made reference to the, you know, uh, the the speculation about a recession. Uh, you're you still got a lot of uncertainty that you're managing. So talk a bit about what that is in 2021, and anything else that that Longmonters ought to hear from you two about city finances and what what to anticipate or maybe to be looking for or listening for as the year unfolds. Well, Jim, go first, and then I'll go. Does anyone really look forward to city finances? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. This is, I, I, I've been in these conversations with you for a lot of hours. You're more animated in this conversation today. I love it. So there'll uh, be some people who are interested. 
you know, I don't, I think I have too much new to add to what I've said. I think it's, we're in a, in a strong position because of the fact that that sales tax projection or budget, I should say, for, for 2021 is below our 2020 actual. So that's, that's a good thing where we should be able to easily surpass that budget, hopefully, if everything stays well, and we continue along seeing what we've seen to this point, uh, we should we should do a good job of surpassing that. Uh, it's it's just the what the ser services that are fee based that will continue to be uh, on limited use or on hold until uh, this um, this passes. Um, a golf fund had a record year though. Yeah. <laughs> Shows yeah, you one thing people could do, and they did a lot of it. So. That's actually a pandemic impact, actually. It is, yeah. Well, and it's interesting how, if, if because they didn't have the same limits, they were able to do really well versus outdoor where it did have limits, they were actually restrained in this. Yeah, um, yeah the pandemic uh, across the country has been probably the, uh, it, it has fueled more golf activity across the country than anything right. else could have, beside, besides Tiger Woods, right, to have fueled golf right. activities. Actually, we've, I mean, what's interesting is when we look at it, we've outperformed the Tiger Woods. I mean, the Tiger yeah. Woods were actually seen as the peak. Yeah. We outperformed that as we looked at the numbers. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that I would say is, so we still have demands and demands that um, I don't think we fully understood, but we knew were potentially there. So when we talk about things like do we support the Boulder County Health Department or and, and how we work together too, um, bring forward a five-star program that none of us even had a clue was going to exist yeah. is that we need to support so that can support our local businesses and how can we repurpose folks? How can we potentially support um, vaccine operations as those continue to develop? How do we handle the needs that exist within our community that are the result of the pandemic? And you can see it in our business assistance grants and repurposing people and utility assistance and What's that going to look like as we continue to move forward and people are, so, so there, there's a component of this on services and what do we provide. Um, on the other side of it, it's what's the world like today? Um, and we, we, we have a better sense of the, of what we can expect via the pandemic. You know, Jim and I, what we also didn't say is, you know, man, if we get to another shutdown, who, who's going to survive it? What's that going to look like? Um, who knows? Um, and then, unfortunately, you just see the state of the world or, or the state of the United States today. And I think any of us can answer, you know, clearly, what is the potential economic impact of what we're seeing right now? And, and how is that going to impact us as an organization and a community? Those are all things that you still have to keep in your mind and we have to continue being diligent to diligent to, to try to go, what is the future going to look like in a time that no one's experienced? And um, that's the challenge that we have. And um, I'm lucky that Jim's here. You know, I would say <laughs> one, one thing, if this had happened three or four years ago, when we were not receiving the level of internet sales tax that, that we are today. I mean, in the sense of, we were not receiving it from the providers. Uh, they didn't have to um, register with us. They didn't have to pay us. And a lot of that's changed in the, in the past few years and is actually even getting uh, better going forward. So we were really bailed out by the fact that we were receiving uh, sales tax from, from internet sales activity because they're was a ton of it going on and still continues to be uh, all the way through that pandemic. And I think that, you know, if there, are, if there are entities that didn't have those agreements say with Amazon and, and uh, we're not having, a lot of the places that have a nexus here, we're doing sales over the internet too. And so we were receiving that as well. That, that they lost out if they didn't have those things. And, and we did, and, and, and we, our internet sales activity was up oh, like 150% or something. But we, and we're looking ahead with what the council 
uh, did last summer, getting us involved in the state's internet uh, portal that will allow out of, out of state businesses that do internet business to actually just pay one entity instead of every home rule city in Colorado will act hopefully make it so that those businesses are using that portal to pay Longmont and all the cities in Colorado for the sales they make in our cities. And that might even give us even greater uh, internet sales, sales tax. Well, and I think I'm gonna add one more thing if it's okay. Um, sure, yeah. I think the other thing too that, that I know we've talked about is, is, is again, when you hear me talk about a, a diverse local economy, um, I think because we had a Smuckers producing and Crustables, we still had folks coming into Longmont to work because what was interesting, that product, the demand for that product zoomed in the pandemic and they were having to put, I think, their people on um, distribution amounts. Um, of Exus. Um, I know they were continuing to work and, and, and bring people in. So when, when you talk about a diverse local economy, you, you have to also talk about those components that have come in where, where people weren't going to work in certain communities. Some were still coming to work in our community because of the employment opportunities here. And so the broad diverse local economy, I think was also an important piece of, of what we experienced. And, and we all know that your, the economic development efforts are not gonna stop. You're gonna continue to do the, the, the recruitment of primary employers and, and obviously the success rate has been pretty impressive. Um, so part of the backstory here, as far as I'm concerned for, for Longmonters is just how well these resources have been stewarded. Um, uh, there, there is no luck here. You guys, uh, this, the, the finances are in good hands. Uh, the city and the community are fortunate to have uh, people of your experience and your talent and your expertise. Because um, if, if you guys don't get it right with this part of the operation, nothing else is going to work. So um, thanks, thanks for sharing the story today. Uh, more importantly, uh, thanks for what you do day in and day out in your roles and uh, in your selfless service to this community as the city manager and the chief financial officer. So Longmonters, that is your backstory on city of Longmont finances in the hopefully soon post -pan pandemic and post pandemic era. Thanks for listening. Thank you.